Joseph. He's uh, the store's uh, DI specialist. Um, and uh, stick around after that. We're going to have great discounts and we're going to have a giveaway. This um, Alpha 5100 camera with lens. So, uh, wow. I hope I win. <laughs> That's great. Win it. Um, you have to um, take a picture and uh, hashtag it Sony Store um, today, possibly. And uh, we're going to be uh, picking out the best picture. And uh, so it's up for grabs. Uh, at the end of my presentation, we'll go more into detail about the whole uh, submission process. And after the whole class, we'll actually have like, a network mixer type of thing where we can all meet Spencer, we can all meet each other. Uh, as you can see right now, we have a live Instagram feed going on of photos taken by myself, Spencer, and other people in the store. So definitely, we encourage you to submit photos and join our Creative Academy family. So it's going to be uh, a lot of fun and hopefully a lot of information for you. Um, so let's get started with uh, uh, Spencer. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, guys. So this is historic for me. This is historic for me because uh, this is my first talk as a Sony artisan. I'm actually, I'm, I'm pretty stoked and I see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, so thanks for joining. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be here uh, after my presentation, after Joseph's presentation. So if you guys want to chat, if you want to, uh, if you have questions, uh, I'll stick around. I'll be here all day. Also, because there's a lot of people here, I'm going to be projecting in a, in a weird tone. And so uh, you'll have to forgive this salesman, this car salesman kind of pitch, but that's, I usually talk like this. So, um, but I assure you this slide deck that I'm about to present, I've worked on for several weeks and it, it really just, uh, it speaks for my passions uh, that I have for photography and the equipment that support me throughout my experience. All right, here we go. So we're going to talk about a few things today. Can you guys hear me back over there? Okay, great. So we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about my journey as an artist into where I got today. Uh, we'll talk about my very, very first photos I took um, with a digital camera a long time ago and how awesome they were. Uh, and we're, we're also going to talk about how to discover your style if you're a beginning photographer, how to uh, hone in on what appeals to you. Uh, we'll talk about um, how to juggle being a busy photographer, uh, how to be juggle, how to be busy and a photographer, and uh, also some projects you guys can try to break out of the rhythm. All right. And lastly, I'm, gonna, I'm also going to talk about why I shoot with the equipment that we're surrounded with today. So, I am Spencer Pablo. Uh, I've shot for decades uh, with, uh, with a whole bunch of cameras, a lot of different uh, shapes and sizes. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a friend to guinea pigs, I like to ride bicycles, road trips, and I'm a recent addition to the Sony Artisan of Imagery program. And this year, I won a competition in that corner right over there of this store uh, that sent me to Alaska. Yes. So um, Ashley was here. I went to the store uh, to go pick up a lens. Like I said, I shot uh, with uh, Minolta and Sony for a long time. And for, the, for a good chunk of that time, I actually had, um, I had my eye on this one premium sweet glass. It's a 135 millimeter 1.8, if you guys are familiar with that. It is beautiful. Uh, anyways, I was here to go pick up that lens, and it just so happened that they were having a competition, um, and I said, sure, why not? I'll go ahead and take it. So I took that lens I just bought, and the competition, it was to take a picture with a Sony A7 body, slap it on there, no additional light, uh, straight out of camera, and uh, just see what you can do with the hardware that you're given. And so this is the image that won me the trip. Uh, don't remember all the settings, but I do know it was 135 millimeter, f 1.8 or f2 somewhere around there because i wanted to shoot wide open i wanted to test this new toy so i won the trip with this image here um and they said that i would photograph the aurora borealis and for a southern californian who's used to this that's happening outside i wasn't sure what to expect from the location that is known as a subarctic circle um uh, actually sounds pretty good right about now um so this was the gear that I wore on my back for the entire trip. Um, I brought a lot of bodies. I just, I wasn't sure what to expect. 
Uh, and by the way, this is all my gear. This is stuff that I, I bought because, you know, with my own expenditures because this is the stuff I believe in. Okay. So I, went, I made it to Alaska. It was really awesome. I got, uh, we were pulled by the Iditarod winning dogs that just won the Iditarod a few weeks before. Um, man, Alaska was, was really, really cool. It was so awesome. We hop on this airplane, a small airplane. We landed on a glacier and myself and another photographer were just so taken by the experience that as soon as we got off the plane, uh, she and I just kind of collapsed where we stood uh, to take it all in. The air was so crisp. It was so silent. The only way to get there was by this small, tiny plane. So it was, it was just like this untouched wilderness. And I knew that this was a competition. So I actually had to muster the energy to stand up and take pictures. And so that's me on the glacier. Uh, I have, I've shaved since. Um, so this is a, we actually got to see the Aurora Borealis. This is about two in the morning. And we'd been out there for, I want to say three hours by the time an image like this presented itself to us photographers. And when the adrenaline finally wore off, we were, we just realized it was very, very cold. If you step backwards, you're going to sink into, uh, you know, a mid thigh level snow uh, and the snow finds a way to get into parts of your pants that you had no idea you had breeches <laughs> to. Uh, so I think we all got kind of tired and we decided we would head back. This was one of the best photos that at the time I took. And um, walking back to the, to the private bus, there was a photographer who was already sleeping in the bus. Uh, the three weeks fast pace, uh, three days fast paced trip to Alaska, it just sort of caught up with all of us. So because of all that equipment you saw me carry, I was one of the last people to enter the bus. I, I went to the back of the bus, took it off, put it in there. and so. Right before being the last person to enter the bus, I look up at the sky and I finally saw more Borealis. Um, so this is what I saw. And then I was like, hey, guys, hey, come on out here. And there were two artisans. There was a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, who was in there and uh, a National Geographic photographer who was also part of this group. And we were like kids in a candy store. We were like, oh, my goodness, let's, you know, set up our tripod. And we just started taking pictures. It was a lot of fun. Um, so speaking of the night sky, who here has taken pictures of the night sky before? And I'm not talking about the moon. The moon has been phenomenal this past week. I'm talking about stars, Milky Way, Borealis. It's different. It's, it's, a, it's a different kind of experience. Um, so I'm still learning. Uh, you know, just, just like many of you, um, I'm still learning. This is about an hour, 15 minutes north of us, Mount Palomar, if you're familiar with the area. So I learned that you have to get as far away from the city as possible. And you can see that there's some clouds here. Ooh, that uh, looks kind of fuzzy. It looks better here. But um, you get the, uh, the urban glow reflecting back. So you have to move yourself away from the city as much as you can. And, uh, uh, but with today's uh, sensor technology, you can actually bump up the ISO a little bit. And unlike this, you'll actually get better, you, you'll get better noise control than with this TV. Took me four years to learn that. Four years. <laughs> So uh, I'll talk more about equipment later, but also you want a tripod. Um, here's a photo in which we drove east, uh, southeast, towards Calexico, about an hour and a half. Um, and let's see, I shot this one here with a $20 Home Depot LED uh, flashlight just to kind of paint the road. And so with this image, you've now seen all of my nighttime photo excursions. You know, just, just like you, I'm trying to develop my skills. Now, as awesome as those photos were, I had far less exotic routes. And because of the way I am anal about organizing my photos, I actually was able to go back into the mid-90s and find the very first digital camera shot I took. Okay. You guys ready? <laughs> um, so here we go. <laughs> so this is a, uh, I, I, I want to say it was like 1996 or 90, 95 or 96. This was a Casio QB10. Uh, many consider it the, uh, the grandfather of digital photography, very important milestone in the development to where we are today. Um, this one here put out 320 by 240 pixels. That's less than 0.1 megapixels. Um, and by the way, that ca the camera that I bought that took this shot here is the same price as the RX100 that is right over there. I mean, it, it, I, I thought for that price, um, 
uh, I looked at the sky. I was like, oh, this is so great. I, I, have to run into the, I have to go run into the house to go take a picture of this beautiful sunset. I get this, I get this camera and I'm running outside and I take a picture. I, th I think I take 10 because that's how much that camera could hold at the time. You know, like 10 <laughs> pictures. Click, click, click. Oh, this is a click. You know, and, then I, and then I make it back inside and I connect it to my computer. And I, I, I remember this. I was like looking at my screen and then I was looking out the window. And I was like, ah. so I was, you know, I was, <laughs> I was disappointed, you know. I mean, talk about dynamic range. You got this like muddy thing going on down there. But I kept shooting. I got better equipment. I had no idea what composition was back then. So, uh, you know, you just, you got to keep shooting, right? <laughs> um, and as a beginning photographer back in the 90s, I went through so many phases throughout then, throughout the early 2000s. I went through a, a filter phase. And I, I know I share this with a lot of folks here because I've, I've seen it, uh, where you just, you think, oh, I have to buy all these filters and throw it in front of my, throw it in front of my lens. Or you go through a vignette phase where you put this artificial overdone saturate, um, a vignette at the very corner of your, of your images. Or you oversaturate your images. Um, I even, uh, I brought it with me, I think. Well, I had, uh, I had this uh, ring. I bought more, I brought, I bought a whole bunch of equipment that, was, that I thought was weird, but at the time, I thought every photographer needed. It was like the small gold ring, because, uh, and it reflected light back, because every photographer wants a gold ring reflected on the face of their subject. <laughs> but I, you know, I kept at it. And uh, I just, I found that the more and more I shot, uh, the more and more I, uh, I developed a style. I, I found something that, uh, that appealed to me. Uh, I discovered the types of images I like taking. And I, I found I wanted to simplify. I wanted to strip back a lot of that weird uh, overdone stuff that I did. And uh, I liked images that didn't have distractions. No funky saturation, no crazy vignette. Uh, and this image here was done in the, at the Red Bull Air Race. When, when was the last time we had that? It's been a while, but I think this one was two years. I think this one I did in 2007. Uh, a long lens, shot straight up, very fast shutter speed to, to freeze that, uh, that propeller. You know, and, and I found that I actually really liked lines. So this, uh, so if you see, there's a line here from the DJ equipment. It just kind of leads you to the wine glass. Um, you find that you, uh, you start developing a style. You find things that you like. And I also found out that I fell in love with textures. So you can mix textures, simplicity. Uh, and I found that that permeated through a lot of my imagery. And I was wondering, hey, I wonder if I can throw people in, into this. And so I have textures, I have people, and I actually want to talk about this image right here. Uh, we, were in the, we were in the south of France, and I was like, oh, my wife, your legs look weird. Uh, so I, I wanted to photograph that, then I saw, hey, this is cool, this is a cool texture here. So I, I wanted to take a picture of, of all of that, and then when I, looked, when I looked at it on my camera, I was like, hey, it looks like you need a pee. So this, I printed in large format. It is now in our bathroom. <laughs> so, so you can, uh, you can mix textures, uh, clean, simple lines. Um, and from, you know, it's, it may not be a style for everyone, I realize, because some, some people have called it sterile. But that's OK. That's why you guys shoot. You develop your own signature. Um, before I became a computer scientist, uh, oh. I'm a computer scientist. Before I became a computer scientist, uh, I, I was an architectural major. And so uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to pull from that particular thing that inspired me and still have it in my current imagery. And so life has this way of changing the way that you guys photograph. Case in point, 2010, my daughter was born. And so for about a year and a half, I just became an infant photographer. That's all I did. If it wasn't my daughter, it was my niece, who was born about the same time. They're sitting over there. Um, 
If it wasn't those two, it was the kids they played with. If it wasn't the kids they played with, it was people they knew who had kids who wanted me to take pictures of them. And oh, as an aside, so my daughter was born just a few minutes before this picture was taken. I was cognizant enough to know that I needed to go ahead and not have a smartphone with me. I needed to have an actual, like, real camera with a bigger size sensor. And I'll talk more about that later. You know, and, and I have back here... It's hard for you guys to see, but it says, I shoot raw. I shot this moment in raw because this is a moment you can't get back. You know, you hand that camera, uh, you hand that smartphone, oh my goodness, to someone to take a picture of this moment here, and it comes out blurry. And that's just a moment you won't get back. So that's how come you have to have that good camera with you. Anyway, here, here's an image that, that I did um, into the third week of being a new dad. Uh, and sometimes having photography was the only way that I could be centered and, and sane. I wanted, I wanted her like, ah! But she, didn't, she didn't do that. Um, it was fun experimenting with kids. Uh, it was really cool, but uh, at this point, she couldn't walk, but I, I had this vision. I wanted to see if I could go ahead and do this. Remember, leading lines, you guys will see that. Uh, I wanted her to, to stand. I knew she could do that. She couldn't walk, so you, if you do this sort of stuff, you have to remember to always practice safety. So my wife was right off camera just in case, to capture her just in case she fell. So I took pictures of lots of kids. Lots and lots and lots of baby pictures uh, with many different clients. Um, and it, it wasn't getting old. It wasn't. But I, I wanted to rediscover photography. I wanted to break through this rhythm that I started to get comfortable with. Um, I needed to rediscover photography and actually uh, challenge myself a, a little bit. Andy Katz, he's an established photographer, has dozens of books. Uh, he's, uh, he's very well known in the wine business. He likes to drink, but he, he's, he's a good guy. Once you're really satisfied with your work, you've got some issues. You always have to try to get better. So um, I reached out to a buddy and, uh, and asked assistants to try another activity I hadn't done in a long time, and that was to take pictures of something else. See, the key is to never, uh, never get stale. You have to, you have to keep learning, uh, relearn your craft, and continually find what, what inspires you guys and what moves you. And so um, this was my very first uh, job after taking a year and a half, and please excuse me, uh, uh, first job after taking a year and a half of just straight infant photography. You always have to find a way to keep learning, realign yourself, and get better. This is Hula Ramos of the um, AJ Morning Show. Um, he's also, he's also a, a, a photographer, and he and I like to learn uh, how to you know, just keep getting better. And I, I reached out to him, I was like, hey man, you need engagement photos, because at the time he was, he was, get, uh, he was getting married later in the year, and he obliged. And, you have to surround yourself with the, with the people who, who support that, who like to help you learn about photography. And remember, learning isn't strictly shutter pushing. So when you get a camera, you're not done. Uh, it's reading. It's learning your camera. It's meeting people. It's shooting with people. It's taking classes. Um, so who's heard of Gary Fong, for instance? You guys have heard? He does light modifiers. Did you know he's a big, unpaid Sony shooter? He has a whole bunch of tutorial videos on his website. If you go to his website, he's a big supporter of this. These are some of the rare, uh, resources I've actually used in, uh, in my photography. Brian Smith, he wrote those, these two books right over here. Uh, Gary Friedman, he, he lives up in Orange County. He's big in Sony cameras. And then Meetup, and I see a lot of my Meetup buddies over here. So Meetup, yeah, Yay. Pacific Photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once you learn that, then you can go shoot. You know, you get comfortable with your equipment, um, you, you know, and then uh, you, you're, if you're like me, you want to continually try to learn new things. You want to learn, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're, it's completely dark uh, and you want to know how to handle your equipment because you're taking the picture of that dark sky, it's pitch black. You have to learn your equipment simply by feel. Get comfortable with it. You know, rinse, repeat, learn, and then shoot. So now I want to talk to you guys about like what I do. I'm a busy guy. I sometimes work 16-hour uh, days. Uh, I, I, uh, I get so wrapped up in my profession that before I know it, I'm out of the office. It's been 16 hours, and uh, I go on travel. Uh, I go on travel quite a bit. Uh, this is my cubicle right over here. Uh, airplanes, 
And then actually right now, at the time I made this, it didn't seem so appealing, but now, you know, this like snowy place here. Um, sometimes my work didn't really begin until I actually got to the hotel. So I'm out on the field all day. I'm just super busy and sometimes I forget. I need to take pictures. So San Diego is a Navy town. Who has seen the shipyards? Yeah. Uh, so the shipyards, right? It's not really known as a photogenic kind of environment. Uh, so Norfolk in, in particular, and I know I'm slaughtering this name because the, the locals there actually say it in a way, they say, oh no, you're saying it wrong. But if I were to say it like they did, it would sound like a swear word. But Norfolk, uh, I've never heard that it's a beautiful destination. Well, did you know that this is right by the airport? Uh, right next to the airport. In fact, if your flight is, is delayed, you can actually just go, okay, I'm gonna leave the airport really quick. And they have a door specific to uh, the terminal where you can just go into this garden. You can fit it right before your flight. And I had a buddy who had a drop off uh, earlier. Uh, he had an earlier flight than I did. So I dropped him off and I had a little bit over an hour of daylight before, uh, you know, before dinner. And I was like, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and discover this location. So I discovered, uh, and I started uh, looking around this particular area right next to the airport, which was free, uh, right before dinner. So San Diego also has a lot of IT. Who is in that field? Who's in IT? San Diego, guys. There we go. Okay, do you know what this is? Th these are servers. These are servers that sit in a rack in a loud room. And so my point is, you have to kind of find, you have to find beauty in things you normally wouldn't. Um, get a different perspective. So, let's see here. You just got home from Home Depot. You're making something, your daughter's interested. Grab that camera, bam, photo opportunity. Okay, count, go out to take pictures with your, because you're at home watching a child. Well, go get another camera and then you both can take pictures. And so by the way, this, this camera uh, as a tip, um, Sometimes I like, to photo I like to photograph kids and sometimes it, uh, it takes them a while to warm up to me as a photographer. So what I do is I hand them an old camera or my second body and it makes for great props also. And when you do take pictures of them, remember to go low, get them at eye level. And so I, I do this a lot, right? I hand kids cameras a lot. I call it the insurance camera for multiple reasons. And then when you guys go on vacation, oh, of course, you'll have that camera with you, right? Because everyone needs to take a break. Because I had a camera within an arm's reach, it makes capturing moments like this easier. And I hope there's sound. Which, uh, which one am I out of? Let's try this one. Is there a volume I can push up on these guys? Oh yeah, right here. Look at that. That looks really cool. Woo, it's like hit. All right. See if this works. Oh, oh my gosh, she's laughing. Is that the first time you heard her laugh? Yes. <laughs> so, because it was within an arm's reach, boom. Hey, it looks like it's a, it's going to be a great camera. I I was able to capture my daughter's first laugh. Uh, and, and I like laughing, so it's important to me. So as projects that I want you guys to, to do to try to break out of the rhythm that you do, uh, that you have, uh, because you can fit photography everywhere, but sometimes you get in that funk uh, from a work trip to uh, the life of a cubicle dweller like myself, you know, you always have to have that camera at your side. And when you have a camera at, that, at your side, uh, you know, it, it makes capturing these moments that I'll talk about right here uh, easier. And I need to stress this first bullet. You need a good camera with you. Uh, you can enjoy your passions, go outside, go in, stay inside uh, with friends, with family, uh, and you can change it up a bit. And I'm, a, I'm about to talk to you guys about some projects that you can try to break out of this funk or, uh, or rhythm. So discover your city. Um, I, may, I mentioned earlier that I like riding bikes and I'm riding a bike down in the South Bay and I notice this new construction and over time I frequent this area I noticed there's more and more and more graffiti that goes on this wall. 
And I'm like, you know, there's a point at which this graffiti stops being graffiti to me and it starts just becoming color. And I see more and more color and I, I'm like, hey, I want that to be a backdrop for an image. And that's, I did this because I was discovering my city. You know, just make sure you, if you do this stuff, you don't capture anything vulgar on that wall. You gotta be cognizant of that. Um, another, and this is, this is a, a good one, Fo you photograph strangers. You can do street photography. Uh, this one here is Tea Deli in Hillcrest. Um, if you guys have been there, really good tea. And then this, uh, she was between train cars in Alaska. I was just showing her my equipment. I was like, hey, look at this camera. Um, and she said, oh, that's really nice. Can I take a picture of you? Why, sure. And this next photo is, uh, is special to me because it's, uh, during this competition I had in Alaska, there's a whole bunch of photographers running around this train, and uh, I just, I, I got tired. I sat down and I struck, a, I struck up a conversation with a couple behind me. And these guys here, uh, I, fi I find out that they're uh, on their anniversary, I think they've been married for like 30 years, first time in a train, uh, they're from Anchorage, uh, and during the, during the conversation, the guy asked me, hey, can you take a picture of us? And, he, and I was like, oh yeah, sure. So he proceeds to hand me his like, entry-level Kodak point-and-shoot camera, um, and I'm like, oh, you know what, no, tell you what, let me use my own equipment. So I, take, uh, so I dial in this camera right over here, and once I, once I got it dialed in, I asked him for his SD card. I popped it in mine, and I took, a, I took a picture. I handed him his SD card back, and then I had to go get some food. So then I left, and, and uh, I think we said, hi, you know, how's it going? They went to go get food, and then we went our separate ways. Well, later, when I finally made it back down to San Diego, I was greeted by a Facebook friend request, and I found out that this lovely couple here, I'll, I'll read this. It was good talking with you and glad you all had a wonderful experience. Please feel free to look us up if you're ever this way again. Oh, by the way, you should hit Sony up for commission. We uh. bought an A7. <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying. So uh, who here has, uh, has heard also to never photograph during high noon? Yeah. Never do it, right? Well, as a project, you can try doing that. Just make sure you come packing a lot of light to reflect that light to fill in the, the, the shadows. Or you photograph with a sensor that has such high dynamic range that you can bring that detail back in post, uh, post processing, editing later. Also, another project, get a different angle. Something that you're not used to seeing. You know, and the articulating screen that these Sony cameras have, it, it really it helps you because you can do these Hail Mary shots like this. And, and get these new angles. And you know, it, this is a style I developed when I, uh, when I spent a good long time photographing kids. You don't always have to photograph kids. You could photograph cars. You know, just spend a day taking weird angle shots. Um, another one is to shoot with one lens at one particular focal length and tape it and, and keep it that way. And sometimes you'll get photos that don't work. And sometimes you'll get imagery that looks so good, because, but it's so different because you never would have thought to pick up that lens to take a shot like that. Either way, you learn your lenses and your camera's capabilities. So who here likes cooking? I like cooking. Make a cookbook. That's it. Make a cookbook. <laughs> and, and so uh, the last project I'm going to discuss is your home. And, you know, I'm... I'm how many people here have other people's art on their wall? Yeah, there's a lot of, I'm just thinking a lot. Yeah, I, okay. Well, why don't you make a day of, uh, uh, where, where your sole purpose for that day is to populate your walls with your own stuff? Ma'am, if I may, what is your name? Bianca. Bianca, beautiful name. How about have a Bianca original over the mantle, right? So you got, you know, just, just do this. Turn your home into your own gallery and print your photos change them often, see how you're developing. Um, this is my hallway, this is right next to my, uh, my office, uh, right next to my computer that I process. My daughter writes in the, uh, these letters all the time and she reminds me, hey, I'm the best daddy. So I do that when, you know, when I'm processing and it's two in the morning. Anyway, so now I'll actually, I'm gonna share with you guys and, and I don't want you to go, oh, this is yucky, these are marketing slides. I wanna share with you guys why I shoot with the equipment that you're surrounded with today. Um, I'm telling you the same exact thing that I've told my friends for years. It's just now in a convenient PowerPoint slide. 
Uh, so I, you know, I need to remind you guys that I, I shoot with all the, uh, with the stuff I shoot with, it's all out of my own pocket. Uh, it's paid for with my money. It predates my time with Sony. Ask my friend. Alfred, here's my friend. Alfred, would you stand up, please? <laughs> he is my friend. <laughs> and what camera do you shoot with? Sony. For a long time. Yeah. There you go. So, so now I want to share with you guys why I shoot with Sony. So we're going to start with Sweep Panorama. So Sweep, Pan Sweep Panorama, sometimes you, there's a, a, a scene that just won't fit in a typical frame. So I put this in Sweet Panorama mode. Like there's a lot of people here. There's no way I'm gonna get this in one frame. But I just do this. My memory card is locked. You know, I should test this stuff before I do this presentation. So I do this. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna fit everyone. <laughs> Tell me no card, I know that. but. It's hard to see, but everyone fits. I can see the entire store here because, and it's one shot, and there are places around town that actually print this panoramic um, uh, format. The nice thing about these Sony cameras also is that the uh, Sony makes it so that it appeals to multiple skill levels. Um, focus peaking uh, is, is something that, uh, as I started to advance more, uh, I found out was very, very helpful. Um, this is a really nice tool. Focus peaking shows you exactly what's in focus. Uh, if you see that red noise around here, that means that part is in focus. There's no red noise here, that means it's out of focus. And it's important to know that because when you're taking a picture and you're looking at a small viewfinder or a small screen, sometimes you don't know exactly what you've nailed with regards to focus. Um, and I know you can get focus peaking on other, on other systems, but what is uniquely Sony is the fact that you can do this and autofocus at the same time if you have a camera that does DMF, and a good chunk of these do. So another one I actually want to talk about is eye focus. Sophia Loren, beauty is how you feel inside. Oh, beauty is how you feel inside, and it reflects in your eyes. So eyes are so, so important. And as a, a portrait photographer, you have to know, you have to nail the eyes. It's the most critical part. So when you shoot wide open, especially with a full frame uh, sensor and big, bright, wide open glass, you realize that that depth of field is so razor thin, you take that image and then you, you go home and you look at the image and you're like, oh, uh, the nose, the tip of the nose is very, very sharp, but the eyes are, they're just beyond the, the focus field, right? And it's this, I don't know, what is it, like an inch maybe? I have a small nose. Maybe an inch. So in that, in that depth of field that is so razor thin, the, the focus just falls out. And so IAF is really cool. I'm going to borrow a model here. Let's see. Sir, may I? Oh, may I? <laughs> Come in here. You've got glasses. This, this, might, this might be a challenge. Can you take the glasses off? I just want to see if this, this works. Oh, and then step right. I know, it's weird. The cable is only so long. So I'm going to tilt this up. You, you guys notice it's already throwing kind of a, a square around his face. It recognizes that there's a person there. So can you step closer to this? So IAF is this. I'm going to focus on you. And then when I focus on you, keep an eye on his eyes. Okay. There we go. Look at his eyes. Do you see that? Did you see that? It happened for a brief moment. There was a green square that went over his eyes. And that is IAF. Thank you so much. Uh, that IAF, make sure you nail the focus on the eyes. Again, it's a tool that portrait photographers would use. You, you always want to make sure that the eyes are sharp. So, uh, and th the articulating screen, I've mentioned this a lot of times. The articulating screen, you can photograph dangerous cliffs without actually endangering your own life. Um, and you know, you can kind of do this, take a picture of that cliff. And this is the shot, by the way, I took with that one. This was a, a while back. Uh, by the way, this is uh, right outside of Page, Arizona. If you've ever been, it's free to go to this thing. You park your car on the side of the highway. You, you hike for about half a mile to three quarters of a mile. You see this cliff. It's so amazing. You take your picture and then you walk back and your car's right there. All free. So apps for cameras with app capabilities. Also, this one's a really cool feature of the Sony. And it's, an, I think, uh, the majority of the Sony cameras that are released now. Uh, you get time lapse. You get uh, smooth reflection, star trails. You don't get Angry Birds, which may be a good thing. 
but you also get this cool uh, ability for you to, t to use your camera like normal, take pictures, and then all the images that, uh, that are on the car that are in here will get sent over to your smartphone. And then at that point, you can send it on Facebook, tweet it, Instagram, all that stuff. And it's, it's also really cool to be able to, to tether with a smartphone. Here we are again. How are you guys doing? So you know when you're, uh, when you're taking a picture uh, and it's a, a large gathering and someone brings a tripod uh, and you're like, oh, I, I want to be part of this image. I want to be, be part of this picture. And you put it on 10 second shutter and then you run really fast and you're all sweating because it's a hot day like today. Uh, and and you're, you're running and you get over to where you need to go and you don't know if you counted it in your head the 10 seconds backwards and sometimes your face just comes out like, like that. And that's a shot you take. Well, on this one here, I have, oops, I have the image right from that camera and I'm just gonna place myself. So, oh, hey. Oh, there, there I am. And then I'll take the shot. There we go. So convenient, so casual. I'm not sweating much. Um, uh, and that, that is all because of this remote shutter uh, capability. Let me put this back here. If I remember how to do this. There you go. Oh, good, thanks. So another really cool thing is we, we picked up this car um, up in Northern California and we put the, uh, a camera, this camera in fact, uh, you can see it right over there on suction cup mounts and there's some really, there's some fun driving and so we're just taking pictures. My wife is in the passenger seat. She's taking pictures um, safely, doing video, there's, uh, you know, and uh, you can do all this stuff because of that Wi-Fi tethering. No more horrible camera phone pictures, you know, you get that crisp imagery, you get to leverage the optics and the sensor capabilities that's in this platform. Um, and you can also do, the, obviously this uh, wired connectivity is very important to me. You know, when you take some pictures, you can actually put this camera on top of a monopod. Boom, right here. And then you can take some really low level aerial shots of people and just take a picture like that. Uh, I actually use that. Uh, Stephen Hawking was in town, if you guys know who he is. He was in town, he was surrounded uh, by a whole bunch of people. Uh, and I was like, ah, oh, Stephen Hawking, I look up to the guy. And I wanted to take a picture. So that's how I did, I, you know, and it works with Justin Bieber. He's like, oh, he's right over there, take a picture of Justin Bieber. So I did the same thing here. You can see we're here. And I've got, I've got this big, that gigantic phone that I, I brought out. And uh, you know, we, we did this, we're like, hey, Merry Christmas uh, from the Christmas Panda. He knows you know, when you've been good or bad, and he also knows where you sleep. So, Zeiss, and this is awesome because I wanna show you guys, this is, um, and it's, it's killed a little bit on a, on a 1080p screen, but I'm at 200% magnification. This is the actual image right over here. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm right in the middle, uh, and this is the kind of, oh, this is not, there we go. This is the quality you get completely wide open, that sharp. And uh, if you shoot enough, you find, you, you find that um, it's really difficult to get that kind of uh, clarity, that kind of sharpness, shooting your lens wide open. Zeiss, guys, Ooh, it's yummy. And now this is the biggest reason I actually shoot with Sony, and that's dynamic range. This is straight out of camera, and then the next one is something I did in post, and uh, I did in editing. Uh, from the same image, I was able to extract the detail from the darkness, the, the shadows, and still maintain my cloud fidelity, if you guys notice. And dynamic range is so important. There's a lot of photographers who are actually dumping their other systems. Um, like Frank Durhoff, I don't know if you, he's a he's a big name in glamour and fashion photography. He has, he had a lot invested in Canon, and he dumped all of that, and he went over to uh, to Sony for all of his full frame imagery because of the dynamic range. So speaking of full frame imagery, this one here is gonna be, uh, I actually wanna get a little nerdy with you. I'm a big nerd. Uh, let me get a drink here. So these are sensor sizes. Who has an iPhone? There's gotta be at least one person in here with an iPhone. <laughs> so iPhone, 
you're this right here. This is your sensor size. Obviously your iPhone, I mean, this has exploded for you, but this is your iPhone sensor size here. This half inch, this one here goes in higher end point and shoot cameras. The Sony Xperia Z1 or Z2 has this. So these are, your, this is your smartphone territory. Then you move up uh, and your smartphone territory and then premium smartphone territory and high end um, point shoots. And then you get the one inch, which is in your RX100. Uh, RX10, those kind of uh, those kind of cameras. By the way, generally reviewed to be the best pocketable camera uh, in existence. That's one inch. Then you start going into interchangeable lens land uh, with the micro four thirds. I've got some Canon shooters. Who shoots with Canon crop sensors? Canon crop sensors. Who shoots with Nikon or Sony crop sensors? I know you do. <laughs> so. You know when you put lens, uh, your lens on, you have to multiply by one point, for Canon guys, you have to multiply by 1.6. And then for Nikon or Sony, you have to multiply by 1.5. And now you know why, it's because there's a small, the Canon sensor, APS-C sensor, is a little bit smaller than a Nikon or Sony sensor. And then you guys get my favorite color, orange. You get full frame, <coughs> excuse me. And the full frame, it's, it's actually on this camera. It looks a lot bigger because I have this flash. But here's this one. This is a full frame camera. Same thing as this. Same thing as the A99 that sits over there. And now, why do you shoot with a full frame? You shoot because your photo sites are larger. You let in more light. You get um, a more dynamic range, less noise. And when you get a big sensor like this, it actually allows manufacturers to throw more megapixels in there. So when you get more megapixels, what do you get? More detail. So you know, you take a low light image with a smartphone and it comes off blurry, it comes off soft, it comes off, uh, it comes out very noisy. Um, or the smartphone itself will have this built-in software you don't have access to that tries to take out that noise, leaving you with a blurry image. So long story short, what you, you want to take good pictures. So you have to get the appropriate camera and, and have it with you. Don't depend on your smartphone. Speaking of tools, speaking of things to have with you, uh, I'm almost done. So I, I, if I could go back to my early days and tell my early photographer self, hey, you know, don't buy weird stuff. Focus on, on these things. What I, what I would do is I would tell that Spencer from 15 years ago, hey, man, get a good camera. Uh, if you invest, if you guys invest in an in interchangeable lens system, get a protector for the filter. Now there's two schools, right? There's those who go, I, I'm not gonna put a filter at the end of my lens because it's gonna degrade my image. And then the other school that says, well, you know what? That, that degradation in image quality is well worth it. I belong to the latter one because I have had that filter sacrifice itself so many times to a bug or a fallen lens and the, the filter's like, no, no, I got this, boom. And then it shatters and the lens is, and the lens is flawless. So I, I, I really depend uh, on getting the filters. Don't, don't get the plastic ones, get the good ones. Zeiss, Hoya, uh, B plus W, get those things. Uh, also you get uh, spare genuine batteries and I say genuine because I have experience and I know a lot of you guys may have experience shooting with third party uh, batteries and the third party inside uh, it's not built to the same quality and so what happens is it, it has the potential to actually destroy the cameras that they go in. Um, Get a sturdy tripod with disconnected legs. Disconnected legs, what does that mean? That means it does stuff like this, woo! Uh, you can do that because there's gonna be situations that you're gonna want to independently move your legs of the tripod. Um, also get a good flash. Get two, you'll see it's under my bonus. Get two, if you, it's not broken, it just it does this. Um, get two so that you can uh, also trigger a wireless uh, other flash if you shoot with Sony. Um, also get software that organizes and processes raw. And this is, this is the expenditure that I'm like, okay, look, if you want to be frivolous, you want to get something else, get one of these bounce reflectors. Let me not smack you in the face. Um, get one of these multi-purpose bounce reflectors because when you shoot at high noon and you need to throw some extra light into someone's face, you have this and inside you have a, a cooler one that doesn't uh, change the temperature so much. And then inside here, you get a diffuser, so then that way, hey, you can actually block some of that light. This is a, can you guys see my hand right here? So it, it blocks the light. Um, not, not completely, but it, it gives good shade. Alrighty. 
I want to I want to end with this. Uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson. He's a, a pioneer in uh, street photography. He says your first 10,000 images, photographs are your worst. And I would agree that with his sentiment, saying that you need to keep practicing, you need to go out, you need to keep shooting. And uh, also. If you notice, he, he shoots with a simple camera with premium glass. I like to think that if he was alive today, he would actually shoot with the RX-1, this one here. Um, I want to end, I want to end, I wanted to end with that, but then they said, hey, you know what? Show this, and I forget. Photography is a lot of fun. It is. This is Brian Smith. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. He shoots celebrities. I happen to be here for this. This is Andy Katz, another artisan, and notice the strategic placement of the antlers <laughs> behind me. So always, always have fun when you guys take pictures. <coughs> Thank you so, so very much for letting me speak with you guys. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So during the transition, for me to get my PowerPoint set up, we're going to have a quick little q and If you guys have some basic questions you'd like to ask Spencer, I think my Spencer's going to be here pretty much for uh, I'll be here all day. until everybody disperses. So everybody will be able to ask more detailed questions after the presentation <coughs> as well. So um, it's only going to take me about a minute and a half to get this set up. So let, let me get my voice back. Hang on. Mm. All right. Yeah, you guys have any questions for me? Yes. Uh, you wanted to know more about IAF? Okay, so on these cameras, first off, I don't know if you guys saw the step before IAF. The camera knew it recognized that there was a face there. It threw a big square around that face. Um, hold on. Oh, thanks. Cool. So it threw a big square around that face. So that's the camera's computers honing in on that on that image. And then IAF takes it from there, and it goes, okay. So this is a face. Using pattern recognition, it knows where the eyes are, and it goes, those are the eyes. Let's focus on that. And it re it really doesn't. It doesn't take more than, I think, a split second for how, however long it takes for you to push that additional button in the back that's, that engages IAF. Um, yes, it was, was I good? Did... Oh, uh, so this one is the A7R. The A7 has it. The um, uh, RX100 Mark III, I believe, has it. Uh, 2014 camera. Right, anything you can buy in here, I think, with the exception of the first RX1. Yeah. 77 Mark II? We'll yeah. I, I think it leverages off of the Bion's X. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely using that process here. Uh, oh, no. It works with iPhones, too. Yeah. It, 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 works with, uh, it works with uh, all phones except for the Windows one, I think. Um, uh, the, the nice thing, though, about getting an Android device, and it doesn't need to be a Sony one, is it has NFC. I don't Can you hear me? I just tap, it, and it's going to happen again. If I just tap this one over here to the side, there's a little NFC tab here. And it has to the camera to say, oh, there's a smartphone that wants to talk to me, and it does it without you having to go to the menu. Anyway. I want to switch the conversation to uh, software that you use to organize your blog. Uh, <laughs> all of that stuff off. And by the way, uh, I have that same file from the 90s. It's been backed up multiple times. Don't think it's <coughs> hard. You guys, back up your images. I've lost a lot of hard drives. So you recommend that right to the X7 doesn't have that. No, it was, it was literally everything after the NX7. Yeah. No. It's a really neat feature, though. Very neat feature. It is. kind of solution that exists for less than 100 bucks. I know DXO has some software also. I think it encroaches a little bit more. Uh, but I, I'm just a big fan uh, of the, six, no. the uh, process. The 6,000 will have it, which is a replacement uh, of those two. <laughs> four, yeah, no. five hours, because Lightroom allows me to sync. We'll wait until the same. But that's a great question. Lightroom, that's what I do. Okay. Okay. Um, I shot this a lot. Daniel, it's in the spring, but it is a little bit. 
in the winter, I want to shoot the northern lights. Oh. And so I just got to go to your studies. But what lens will you share? So Boom. you want to shoot wide. Oh, yeah. You want to shoot wide and you want to shoot as bright. Um, what body do you have? Um, I have the A77 and I also have the okay. uh, 11. Uh, every single 4X. Okay, so you have the A77. Um, you have to glass Yeah, Perfect. Yeah, I'll go there. Very, very soon. It's on my bucket list. But yeah, the bright glass. I uh, highly recommend a remote shutter. Uh, a little cable that comes off uh, your back over there. Remote shutter, so then that way you don't uh, jiggle with the. Uh, with a camera, and you're likely going to shoot in full, uh, where you're in control of how long the shutter is, instead of saying, I'm going to shoot at 5 seconds, I'm going to shoot at 10 seconds, I'm going to shoot at 30. You're in control. So as soon as you want to stop the exposure, you let go. And, and that concludes <coughs> All right. So any other questions, of course, like I said, we'll have it at the end of the class. We will move into our standard Sony Creative Academy class, which is the basics class taught by myself. Uh, quick reminder, after the class, we are going to have more information about how you guys can win that awesome A5100 camera, which is a brand new camera that just came out. Uh, we're also going to have information about how to get you involved with our social media and getting your photos posted, sharing it with everybody else in this class, including myself and Spencer, so you can ask us questions later on down the road if you want to come into the store. Keep in mind, this is the first out of the three classes in the series. So this is the beginner's class. I know a lot of people might be intimidated by the photos they just saw that Spencer showed. We all are in that stage every now and then. We've all been there, or we might be there right now. So the whole point of this class is to help um, inform you and give you the necessary resources to be able to take photos that Spencer took. Keep in mind that Spencer's photos look awesome. Although they're intimidating, every one of you in this classroom can take a photo like that. And I believe, I truly believe that with all my heart that everybody can achieve those photos. The, all three classes are recommended, and since they are free, you are more than welcome to repeat these classes because we all do forget things every now and then. All right, so let's start with photography basics. My name's Joseph Homiuni. You can call me Joe. I am the DI specialist, digital imaging specialist of the store. This is my photo that I chose to share with you. This was shot when I had my A77. This is my dog Slater when he was a puppy. Very cute photo. I love taking photos of my dog. I don't really have a shooting style. I am a overall shooting. My main uh, aspect of photography is to present a photo off the camera. That means that I don't process anything in any software. My photo comes directly off my SD card and I share it directly to the world. So uh, in a sense, no post editing, none of that. So today we do have a lot of information to go through, but this presentation is actually not that long because it's a very generalized, easy presentation to help you get into photography more. We're gonna get you out of auto mode. Everybody knows that auto mode when you put the battery in the camera and you just point and shoot. We're gonna change that and we're gonna help you learn how to take different photos of portraits and objects, landscapes, macro, which is known as your close-up photos like of food and um, even those eye photos you've seen, flowers, stuff like that. Action photos where you wanna freeze motion and low light photos as well. But wait, of course, there's more. We always have more. There's a bunch of information when it comes to the world of photography. We'll give you some tips and tricks, what camera settings work best for each of these scenarios, and what extra features our cameras have, which uh, Spencer did mention, like the eye autofocus. We'll, go, we'll quickly review over that as well. So in everybody's camera, whether you have a Sony camera, a Canon camera, a Nikon camera, you have something called a scene mode in it. A scene mode is a mode that is a pre-programmed setting in your camera. Basically, what this allows you to do is, before you step into the world of manual and understand how everything works, this is the basic foundation of it. The scene mode will have a sunset mode, a twilight mode, different modes where the camera already knows to hit these certain limits of adjustments so that you can achieve these photos in a quicker, easier fashion. Since we are a Sony store, we do have examples of our Sony cameras. Most of your cameras will have a dial on the top of the camera, easily labeled SCN, stands for scene. Some of you with older Sony cameras will notice that there is no SCN, they're actually gonna be individualized icons. As far as your NEX users or your small compact cameras um, who don't have the dial on the top, the dial is inside on the screen in a menu button. So. Now that we've talked about the basics of the camera, let's get started into these different techniques we're gonna talk about. 
So the most common photo people shoot today is portrait and object photography. The whole goal of that is to focus on a single item or person, keep them in focus, and basically eliminate all possible distractions that are in the photo. How do we achieve that? We achieve that by blurring the photo with a, what we call depth of field. So by blurring the photo, a lot of people think that they do this by post-editing, but in reality, it's really easy to do with any one of our cameras, depending on the amount of light you have in the photo. <clears throat> Another tip about portrait photography, and I will go into more detail as how we achieve that photo. Another tip about portrait photography, or when you're taking photos of objects, is get closer. It's something that we like to call sneaker zoom. You'll notice that a lot of cameras, when it comes into the professional end of cameras, or semi-professional, where all of you are probably heading towards, uh, they're interchangeable lenses. And you notice the lenses don't zoom as much as those point and shoots that we're used to. There's no more 50 times zoom, none of that. That's because the sensor, first of all, is about six times bigger. So with a bigger sensor, you need a bigger piece of glass and it just starts to cost way too much money. So the typical thing is what we call sneaker zoom. Sneaker zoom means that I can have my camera and I can just walk, use my sneakers and zoom in. And it is something that point and shoots have caused us to become lazy and not walk up to it. But you'd be surprised by taking three steps forward you'll get so much more zoom, and it's pretty amazing what you can achieve by seeing something at a different angle. So what happens when we walk closer to the statue? There's mini statuettes inside the statue's hand. You would have never known that if you'd have zoomed in with a camera, you probably would have missed that. By walking up to it, since you're more um, enthralled by what's going on in the image, you're more observant of what's uh, around you, you'll be able to see these little objects in the image. So the next thing is, the rule of thirds. This is a standard theory taught in photography classes. Um, I don't know if most of you have heard about it. A lot of people have. The rule of thirds means that we split our screen into a grid line of three. So there's a total of nine boxes in this grid. In the rule of thirds, it's perfect for portraits and objects because we want to place the subject following the rule of thirds on the left side, usually. Now keep in mind that in America, we read left to right. So that is why we place it on the left side. Depending on the culture you're in, for instance, I was born in Japan and we read right to left. So for myself, it is a little bit different to see it on the left. I'm used to seeing it on the right. So rule of thirds does change based on culture and based on location and based on your audience. So remember, your photo is your story. So you're gonna tell the story based on how you wanna present it to your audience. Another thing to note is that, let's just go with the idea that we want to place it on the left-hand side. If I place on the right-hand side, it actually will make the photo seem more uncomfortable. Because what happens is that you naturally read left to right. So you're going to expect a smooth face here, looking to the right, and it's going to be a nice smooth flow. When it's on the right side, now you have empty space that's not in focus, and then your brain starts to get confused, and then you see this person in focus, and you can actually create different emotions to be felt through an image. It's really neat what you can do. So this is the center of a photo. Looks like the standard photo that we take at home of our kids and whatnot. Very basic photo, quick point and shoot. <clears throat> now, I want you to keep in mind, look at the background. When we shift him to the left, you'll see more of this trail in the background because just a simple outline is showing more because the road is curving. So now, we, when we start to think of an artistic way, now we want to know what's going on behind him. Was he on a journey? Did he just come from a hike? There's all kinds of stories that can be created behind this photo. And like I always mention, everybody has their own story behind the photo. And that is the, that is the um, interesting thing about photography, is that you don't know the story until you talk to the photographer. And what you think can be completely different than what the photographer meant to present to you. Keep shooting. So as you saw, Spencer's last uh, quote was there, how the first 10,000 photo uh, photographs that you take are the worst. Don't ever think that they're the worst. None of your photographs are ever bad, but the idea, the concept behind it is to keep taking photos. We are in a digital age now. Our memory cards can hold unlimited storage because we can easily delete the photos. So make sure you take as many photos as you can. We have different modes in the camera, and in this situation, we have something called a continuous mode. So I'm sure everybody has gotten to the mode where they switch it to that self-timer, where it's like a five-second timer. When you go through this mode, it's called a drive mode. You'll see multiple boxes, and the multiple boxes stand for multiple shots. And all you do is you hold the shutter button, and you take multiple shots. And what happens when you take these multiple shots? You might have thought that this photo was great, but now the baby started laughing in the middle of the photo. And you wouldn't have caught that by taking a single shot. So I always take multiple shots. I average. If I go out shooting for an hour, I shoot about 450 shots minimum. 
and I might only come back with five or 10. So keep in mind that don't ever be discouraged by your photos and by taking a lot of photos because the photos that you become satisfied with and the photos that you choose are gonna be moments that you never thought you'd have captured. And then the other thing, of course, is experiment with angles that I mentioned a little bit earlier. You'll hear me say that a lot. You'll hear me say two things a lot. Shoot a lot, keep shooting, and experiment with angles. So you can experiment high up, low, tilted camera. You'd be surprised by simply angling a camera. You might capture something in the background like a red flower that might be blurred and it'll give an accent to an image that you never thought was there. So like I said, always, always shoot a lot, experiment. It's a very fun thing to do and it's never a waste of time because you never know what you're gonna get out of it. It's always fun. The other thing is, watch your backgrounds. So when we compare these two photos, there is a very interesting concept behind it because what happens is when it comes down to photography, it is very subjective. So it is based on you, the photographer, not what I say, not what Spencer says, not what anybody says. It's based on what you think is the best photo. A lot of people will think that this photo is much better than this one and vice versa. And it's really down to what type of shooting style you have. For instance, some people like the lines in the photo. Some people just like focusing on her and the angle of the scooter that she's sitting on. Now, the interesting thing is um, when we change angles, changing angles also means using that sneaker zoom and stepping back a few feet. When we step back a few feet, now we capture this image. So very, very, very big things can change in an image just from that. And just to let you know, if you have any questions, you can ask the questions during this portion of the class, uh, throughout the class. I don't want you guys to get confused since this is the actual academy part. Just ask questions and I'll definitely help you out. The typical question I get from this photo, which I'm sure somebody in here is thinking it, is why is this photo not following the rule of thirds? So the reason why this photo is not following the rule of thirds is simply because the photographer, from what I derive from the photo, the photographer did not want to focus on the subject, although the subject's part of the photo, the focus of this is the building in the background. Because if she was in rule of thirds, we would have cut out the interesting wave and angle of the building. So keep in mind your backgrounds play a big part in your photos as well, and those can make a big difference. So going more into detail about that soft focus and depth of field. Soft focus depth of field is a great way to isolate that subject, get that blurred background. Because when you have a blurred background, it makes the subject pop out much, much more. So this is why we have something called the portrait mode. Back to that scene mode we were talking about, the portrait mode pre-programs uh, specific settings, what we call the aperture, to be lower, which allows for a more shallow depth of field, which allows for the blurring to occur. Now when I say aperture, ISO, and shutter speed, I'm sure some of you are going to be completely confused. So that's why I'm going to try to minim uh, minimize how much I'm going to say that because the next class we focus and go into detail about that and really break it down and help you understand it much easier. The more light you get, the easier it is for your camera to focus on that subject that's closer and it'll just basically think about it like your camera's forgetting about what's going on in the background. It doesn't care, it just cares about the subject. The more light you have, the easier it is to focus on that subject and blur out the background. One quick tip I do want to give about aperture for all of you to think for the next class is what is aperture? Everybody gets confused about what aperture is. The easiest way to relate aperture, at least what I think, and I hope everybody agrees, is relate it to your pupil. Because the aperture is the pupil of the camera, relate it to your eyes. When we walk into a dark room, we can't see, and our pupils dilate, and they get much wider. So the aperture of our eyes open to let more light in. And if you notice in a dark situation, you can't see as far. The stuff in the background's blurry, because you can't see, you can only see what's close to you. That's exactly what's happening in this photo. And if you think of it that way, when you go outside on a bright sunny day like today, your pupils get very small, but you can see miles in the distance. Exact same function in the camera. So very easy to relate it to yourself. If you forget what the camera is doing, just think of it to your eyes and it works the same way. So one feature that Sony has, or a couple, we're gonna talk in this one. A feature that Sony has, which usually comes turned on in I think a couple of the cameras that are available today is called auto portrait framing. So as you saw when Spencer demonstrated with the camera, we had face detection going on. You saw boxes showing up around people's faces. What happens is that the camera will automatically crop the photo. It will keep the original photo you took, but it'll create a second photo where it will crop it and do the rule of thirds on the photo. And it will create a portrait. And it'll create the portrait image out of that standard photo. Now let's jump back to a question that some of you might have is the rule of thirds, as I talked about before. Now the rule of thirds, she's focused on the right. The reason it's on the right is because if you look at her